So I just wanted to thank uh, Debbie and the whole foundation for the chance to come down and uh, just talk to this audience again and thank uh, Olivia for uh, her wonderful work uh, moderating the event. So I just have a couple <laughs> disclosures to make and then I'll move on to slides. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, our work is in studying the cancer genome and there are the cancer DNA and we do this in the context of trying to think about how to make, how to understand cancer and make better therapies. And this is in the bigger picture of a change in how we're thinking about the non-surgical or non-radiation management of cancer. For you know, many, many years, the way we've thought about trying to uh, develop cancer therapy has been with uh, traditional chemotherapy. And it was largely an uh, empiric practice of uh, trial and error, mixing and matching different chemotherapy drugs, which are you know, different toxic uh, poisonous drugs, to try to find combinations that maybe were a little bit better than, uh, what, than what we were doing. But, it, um, uh, but that, that approach, which still is there and still very important and still a cornerstone of, of a lot of current oncology, is being uh, supplemented or even supplanted by a newer way of thinking, which is really to ask the question of what makes each cancer tick? What is it, what's the underlying biology that makes these cancers grow and spread and do their terrible things? And how can we attack the real underlying features that make these cancers cancer. And uh, for, for us, the way we do this, um, you know, just like if your car was broken, you'd want to look under the hood and see what was wrong. Uh, what was broken for our ideas of how to look under the hood of cancer is to look at the genome, the DNA. So the DNA or genome refers to each cell in our body has DNA, three billion letters, strings of ACGs and Ts, which <laughs> together are the cookbook for, uh, for, for life, for all the proteins in our cells. And the genome in cancer can get altered, and that can lead to cells not behaving the way they should. And to keep with the analogy of a car, uh, just like a car has parts that make it go and parts that make it stop, and if you were driving a car where the gas pedal was caught on the floor, it would be going too fast. If you were driving a car where the <clears throat> brake line was cut, it wouldn't be able to stop. And just like the cars have those parts to make things go, to make things stop, all the cells of our body have those same kinds of pieces to them. And the way that one way to think about cancer is that all of those pieces of the cell that are c controlling those critical processes can get altered. Those genes can get changed. And the gene for that gas pedal can be turned on so that it can't be turned off. And the gene that might control the brakes might not work anymore. And so if you imagine driving a car where the gas pedal is stuck to the floor and the brakes aren't working, um, in one way that could be one way to think about a cancer cell. It has things turned on to make it grow, and the brakes that usually would make it slow down aren't working anymore. Um, and when we talk about how the genes can be changed in cancer, I think it's uh, one thing I wanted to take a little time to talk about, and I think this could be very pertinent to what people were asking about this morning, is what are the kind of gene changes we're thinking about, and really the, the difference from what we call somatic changes and germline changes. Um, and so uh, most of what we talk about in the cancer world, when we're talking about cancer genes and targeted therapy, are what we call somatic alterations. And this is really the idea that the cancer cells have genetic changes or genetic mutations that are different from the normal cells in your body. So these are not the genes that you inherited from mom and dad. This is how the cancer has picked up mutations and makes the cancer cells different from normal cells in the body. Now most of the genes we talk about in cancer, be it ERB2 or KRAS or the, you know, um, you know BCR able, the, the genes we often think about, uh, that are altered are altered in this way. They're not what you inherit, it's what you um, acquire. And most targeted therapy that's being developed in oncology is really going after these changes. So these, uh, so this is important in that, so it's not what you inherited, meaning that if you have a, you know, a ERB2 amplified gastric esophageal cancer, it's not that your children are at risk of a, inheriting an abnormal ERB2. This is a way that the cancer is different than the normal cells uh, in the body. You know, by contrast, there are important um, uh, inherited vari vari variations, what we call germline, what you get from mom or dad, um, that we all have 
many, many variations that we inherit, otherwise the world would look like a, you know, a whole bunch of identical twins. Um, and some of those variations can impart higher risk of cancer, such as BRCA1 in breast cancer or CDH1 in um, uh, uh, gastric cancer, or even um, Lynch syndrome that came up earlier in the uh, symposium. So most patients with GI cancer don't have these, so most of what we talk about are actually somatic events. So what are some of these events and how do they potentially matter? So there are different ways the genome can be altered in cancer. You can get what's called a point mutation where a, simple, a, a, a typographical error where instead of an A you have a C or instead of a G you have a T in one particular spot. And there are certain classic cancer genes that are activated this way and in some cases such as EGFR mutations in lung cancer, they can lead to uh, tumors that might be highly sensitive to particular inhibitors. You know, more often in gastric and esophageal cancer, we have what are called uh, copy number changes or changes in the number of copies. For, for, most, for, for all of our normal DNA, for each gene, you get one copy from your mom, one copy from your dad, so you have two copies of each gene. Well, in cancer, sometimes that gets highly de de deranged. Instead of having two copies of ERB2, one from mom, one from dad, you could have 20, 30, 40, 50 copies. Um, and in some cases, that means that that gene is overexpressed and doing its job many more fold. So instead of having a car with one gas pedal, you have a car with like 20 gas pedals. And when you put your foot down, there's all that more kind of push making the car go. And so just like we now we look at Irby 2 copy number to, to see who should get Herceptin or Trastuzumab, there are many cases where we use those markers to think about guiding therapy or, or some cases where we use that. Also, although we don't have these much in gastric and esophageal <coughs> cancer, you could get alterations where two different genes from two areas get linked together aberrantly to make a, a non-normal gene, like half of one, half of other. We call it a chimeric uh, protein, like the uh, <coughs> chimeras in mythology, which is, I think, what, half horse and half man, sort of the same thing. You get two different things that you put <coughs> together, and you can make an uh, abnormal protein. And many of those can be targets of certain therapies, such as the ALK translocations that are targeted in, in lung cancer. So now, now why does this matter? Um, how, how can this be important for cancer? So the ideas are that the tumors become <laughs> dependent upon those genes that are turned on in the cancer, the gas pedal that's making them go. And that often the drugs that can block these, uh, these features making the cancer go uh, can be highly effective therapy. But what's important is that two people can walk into clinic and have cancers that look for all intents and purposes, the same under the microscope, but actually the genes that are involved could be quite different. So which means that cancers which we thought about having, quote unquote, you know, the same cancer might optimally be treated by <laughs> different drugs. And this is a big change from, you know, up till now where we've said, what's the best chemotherapy for gastric cancer? What's the chem best chemotherapy for colon cancer? Which is implicit in that idea is that this is one group of cancers, but actually in reality, when we think about the biology, there's different groups and the optimal therapy is not gonna be the same for everybody. And so the idea is as we could look at the genome of each patient, we can get ideas about what are some of the key features, the key genes driving the cancer, the key, what is the way that the gas pedal is turned on each patient's tumor, and how can we think about that to help us guide more effective therapy for each patient. Um, so in that, when, we, when we're talking about looking at genes and doing therapy, this is not gene therapy. So genes are the recipe for making a protein. So for example, the KRAS gene is the recipe for KRAS protein. The ERB2 gene is the recipe for ERB2 protein. Proteins are do the work in the cell, and a mutant gene makes an abnormal protein. Drugs generally block proteins. So when we, tar we use targeted therapy, we're trying to block the abnormal protein that's made by an abnormal gene. So we're not, doing, we're not trying to change the genes, we're not doing gene therapy, but we're looking at the genes to figure out what are the proteins that we want to target. And uh, fortunately, in recent years, we've made a lot of progress in understanding what are the different genes that are active in different classes of gastric cancer. So I was fortunate to be part of leading a big uh, project through what's called the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, which was uh, uh, um, published in uh, this past year, uh, where we looked at hundreds of gastric cancers and really tried to comprehensively define what was altered. And this, is, uh, this paper is freely available online if you want to look in more detail. And we identified how there were different classes of gastric cancer, and even within them, there were different genes that were 
preferentially altered in different groups of tumors. I, I don't want to go into the details here, but we have a new idea of the map of the candidate targets where we could think about. And even if we go in more granular detail, which I don't want to walk through this carefully, we could see for different types of tumors, you see different classes of candidate targets that are altered in the, the big red boxes here are where you have a gene that's amplified in cancer. The little greens are where you have something that's <laughs> mutated. And um, I don't want to go through the details, but one important thing is among these genes that we see altered, the only one that we're really now routinely going after and targeting in patients is ERB2. But there are many other candidate alterations that are commonly affected in these cancers, and most of these have some type of uh, therapy or candidate therapy that's in existing or in <laughs> development right now. So we have new capacity to try to think how to rationally bring these drugs forward into particular patients using these genome markers to help us guide who should get, uh, who, who may benefit from which therapy. So what does this mean? So we have new ideas about the particular genes that are altered in the genome of many stomach cancers. And this, these ideas give us ideas, these, these, these leads give us ideas about candidate therapies that may be useful. And I know I put a, several caveats in that, um, in that point right there. Um, but however, these data are no way guaranteed that any particular drug or, uh, or target will be effective, but they could help us think about how to design clinical trials in which therapies may have efficacy in particular patients. Um, now, it's easy to say when I present this kind of view of cancer that treating cancer could be easy, that if you'd look at three patients with gastric cancer, they'd come into the clinic and patient one would have a gene X mutation, patient y, next patient would have a gene Y mutation, the next patient would have a gene Z mutation, so you say, oh, this is easy, I'm going to give anti-X, anti-Y, and anti-Z, and everything will be all better. Um, uh, the problem is, is that this approach for thinking about cancer therapy is not a panacea, and there are reasons for that. You know, cancers are smart, they're a pretty mean enemy, and generally when we have a good therapy, um, often the effect is only temporary uh, when it works. So tumors able, are able to develop what we call resistance to therapy, just like we talk about, you know, the resistant bacteria in the hospital that don't work, that the antibiotics don't work anymore. Cancers can become resistant to our therapies, too. Sometimes the resistance is immediate. Other times it takes a while. The tumor gets better, and then it gets worse again. So I think our challenge now is to learn how tumors become resistant and how we could develop better therapies to to, uh, to try to attack the way cancers are going to try to get around, our get around our therapies. And so to do this, this is more than just doing clinical trials. We actually need to do a lot of work in the laboratory to understand um, how to uh, bring our ideas about rational therapy uh, to the clinic. If we have an idea that a tumor has gene X being hyperactivated, so you want to block gene X. You know, but we realize that just blocking gene X with one pill isn't going to be enough. The tumor is going to find a way to work around that. So we want to learn in advance what is the way the tumor is going to do to work around that, and how can we be ready? How can we have that next therapy that that second drug in combination with gene X might be effective? And um, you know, and really, when I think about where this is moving. You know, I think it's moving from this idea of a game of archery. You find the target and you hit the target to more a, um, we have to learn how cancer is going to work around our therapy, and it might be more like a game of chess. When you play chess, you make a move, and you're always thinking about what the next move your uh, opponent is, is going to make in response. So I think what we have to learn now is sort of, as we learn about the genes that a cancer has and learn about the targets we want to hit, we have to learn how to play chess against gastric cancer and many other tumor types. We have to know how the tumors are going to work around our therapies and the reasons they don't work. You know, it's very exciting when our drugs work, but what's most important is when they don't work is understanding why. And those are the rules we have to learn right now. And, um, and so to do this, we have to actually, we can't do this all in patients. We have to do it in the laboratory too. So how are we doing this? Um, so we need to study real cancer in the laboratory. We need to have cancer cells we could work with that have, and we could give them drugs, see what happens, and learn how to make our therapies better. And so we need what we call models of real cancer. We have to grow cancer cells in the lab that are come from real gastric cancers and learn how to investigate the, uh, our therapies and how to, how to find ways that tumors work around them and how to make these therapies better. 
And the truth is we need lots of different models of cancer. You know, we're not going to do a clinical trial in one patient and say, well, you know, Mrs. we gave Mrs. Jones this drug and it worked, so we're going to give every patient this drug now. We also need many models where we could get a sense of the variety of cancer. And this is actually a lot of work and a lot of resources that are needed to, to do this. But increasingly, if we have real models where we know the genes and we could treat them and we could learn the rules of how, the, how to play chess against gastric cancer, and so, for example, in our uh, center right now at Dana-Farber, we're increasingly building efforts where we get samples from patients and um, we you know, then figure out what are the genes altered in these, in these tumors, and then we're trying to make models. So in this case, we show how we could take pieces of a human tumor and grow it in a mouse and then expand that um, uh, tumor in, in, in the back of a mouse. And then over time, you could give those mice um, the same in inhibitors that we'd want to give to our patients, but then we could then do things we honestly couldn't do in a patient. We could, you know, we could give the inhibitor and then two days later <clears throat> cut the tumor out and figure out exactly what's the tumor doing now. So, okay, I blocked gene X, well, <clears throat> what's the tumor doing now? So we could really understand how to more effectively uh, attack these targets, such as ERB2, and how to make better combination therapies that will work better in the future. So, um, so that's sort of, I think, the bigger field of where things are. But I guess a lot of people ask me now, so what should I do? You know, should I get my tumor profiled? Which is not an easy question. Um, well, fortunately, it's often possible, even from small samples, even from a small, you know, endoscopic biopsy, we often have the ability to look at these samples to characterize the genes. Um, it's not standard of care. And the reason it's not standard of care is because things that are standard of care are things that we know what to do with the results. Testing for HER2 is standard of care because we know if we find it, we're going to give this drug. The reason these things are not standard of care is because we don't know what to do with the information. You know, but you know, having these data on your tumor may give you ideas about po possible clinical trials to, to consider. And again, I put a lot of caveats in there. So we, we can't guarantee that you'll find a clinical trial. We can't guarantee that trial will work. But it's something to, uh, to consider as it may give you um, ideas. And it may help when, you get, when patients get to the point where they need to consider clinical trials, especially of targeted agents, to think about if I'd go for a drug against targeting X, Y, or Z, learning about the tumor's genome could help um, to sort of guide that information. And these days, many clinical trials, you might need to have an alteration in gene X to get the anti-X drug. Um, so that's also important. Um, so if people want to do it, how do you go about that? So there are several big academic centers that are doing this routinely. You know, we're doing it at Dana-Farber. I know <coughs> Memorial and many other academic centers are doing this. Often the centers are paying for it independently. Um, there are other companies, a number of companies doing this as a fee for service. Uh, sometimes insurance pays, sometimes they don't. That's very inconsistent. Also, not all companies are created equal. You know, this is now becoming big business, and a lot of people are entering into this space. And so um, I think there's, you know, I think there's questions about what's the variation in quality of what's done at different places, and I think the, the FDA might get more involved in this area over time. Um, and interpretation is still a challenge because there's a lot of things in the, in the cancer DNA, and we don't often know what they mean. And often many tests just look at the tumor, so it's hard to tell what's inherited and what is somatic. Um, but these data could be of help to think about targeted therapy. So summary of sort of thinking about the cancer genome. Um, so mutant or altered genes are, you know, mostly are the, uh, what I view as a primary cause of cancer. And they also can tell us what might be the candidate targets to consider for, for each patient's tumor. And we're increasingly bringing these uh, profiling into the clinic so we could use these data not for routine care, but thinking about clinical trials. And this is a very exciting field, but it's not easy. And we still need to do a lot of work in the laboratory to really figure out how to most effectively to develop these approaches. You know, again, I think it's not going to be just giving one drug, drug for one patient, but really figuring out how to develop effective combinations uh, to, um, to, to, to make these therapies work. And um, just, do I have a couple minutes, or how am I doing? Yes, you do. Okay. Just, I wanted to just quickly talk. 
capture or talk about immunotherapy just because I know there's a lot of interest, even though it's not so much guided by the genome, it's just the, the other kind of like uh, new kid on the block. So, um, so obviously there's a lot of excitement about uh, immunotherapy. Here's from the breakthrough of the year from Science Magazine a year or two ago. Um, so what is immunotherapy? So immunotherapy is using the immune system of the patient to fight the cancer. And uh, there's different classes. You know, some immunotherapies are what we call fairly non-specific. There are, are just more trying to boost the immune system. So some therapies, like what we call checkpoint inhibitors, like Nikitruda, are in this category. They're not trying to hit a particular, you know, and it's not like a tumor vaccine that's making, making an anti-tumor response. It's basically trying to remove the breaks from the immune system. There are other approaches, such as cancer vaccines, which are the opposite. It's actually trying to get the immune system to attack a particular uh, feature of the tumor. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's various sides of this. One is trying to just get the immune system to kind of not slow down. Other is to get it to attack a particular target. And these are both strategies that are under development right now. You know, so this is a, a picture of some of these uh, um, checkpoints, which are basically tools that the body uses to downregulate or to slow down the immune system. In this case, showing how the, there are various targets that can slow down the T cells, the, the cells that can um, a, a, attack cancer with targets such as CTLA-4 or uh, PDL one And these targets are moving forward in many cancers, great data in melanoma, lung cancer, renal cancer, bladder cancer, a lot of excitement coming out. And it was uh, quite um, exciting that actually there was the first positive data in gastric cancer presented uh, this past fall, where they, uh, in a subset of gastric cancer patients, we don't know enough about which patients, this new uh, PD-1 inhibitor, Keytruda, did have efficacy or had some responses in a number of patients. Um, so, and I think immunotherapy is exciting and for a good reason. Um, you know, uh, we, we do have, um, we do not have FDA approved therapies in gastric cancer now. There are some trials emerging. I think probably the one that's moving furthest ahead is probably the Keytruda based on their data they presented. Um, but there's a lot of caveats here. Just like there's lots of rules we have to learn about the genome and targeted therapy, we still have, if not just as many, possibly even more rules we have to learn about these new immune therapies. We still don't have good enough ideas about who will respond, how tumors will become resistant, how to combine these drugs with chemotherapy and targeted therapy, and also when they don't work, what's the reason they don't work and how do we make it better? So I think there's a new set of um, studies we have to pursue in the lab to ask these, these, uh, all of these same um, questions, not just for targeted therapy now, for uh, immune therapies. Um, so with that, um, I want to stop. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. Do we have any questions in the room? I actually have one question that came online. It says, what kind of vaccines can be offered to gastric cancer patients as a standard of care or through clin clinical trials? Well, right now there's no standard of care vaccines for, for any cancer I could think of. Maybe the, I'm trying to think, maybe the closest would be like BCG for bladder cancer, but not, yeah. Um, I think, that, you know, in terms of, I'm, I'm not, definitely, I'm probably far from an expert in cancer vaccine development. Um, so I know there are several uh, targets being evaluated for vaccines. I don't know how much about gastric cancer in particular. So I don't know about particular, do you guys know about vaccine no, trials? Nothing. Yeah, I think most of the, most of the initial work in gastric has been along with like the PD-1 pathway, you know, CTLA-4 checkpoints. Um, so I, th I think we don't have enough idea about the, um, about that. So there might be people who know, there are people who know more about it than I do, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. this is an old Japanese literature where they looked at various immune stimulants and bacterial extracts and, but um, I'm not aware of any vaccine trials that are ongoing. There, there might be one in esophagus cancer looking at testis antigen, mm. but very, very, I think we're, we've been so disappointed with vaccines that I think it, it really, as you pointed out, it really seems that what the cancer does is it, it inhibits the immune response. So the yeah. answer is to overcome that immunosuppression right. rather than try and stimulate the immune system. Right. Or it could be that if you do stimulate over time, you need to also hit the ways that cancer turns off the immune response. Maybe it might be a combination of blocking PD-1 or something and turning on the response, but it's, there's a lot of work to figure that out. Yeah. I'm sorry, Edith. Edith knows some. So 
the vaccine trials in most tumors were um, ended a few years ago. Um, the vaccine trials do require a lot of work. And unfortunately, there was um, a large trial that many were excited about. And unfortunately, um, a few patients had serious toxicities and even death. And consequently, those studies were ended. And that was coupled with the fact that we didn't understand them. And there were fewer, few responses, except in melanoma, a skin cancer. So consequently, there has not been a lot of interest um, in uh, those trials. And all the work, for the most part, has been suspended. Thank you. We have a question here in the front. Yes, Dr. Bass. Um, I understand that HER1, HER1, is a uh, biomarker in gastric cancer. It's one of the few that we have. Uh, 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 EGFR or HER1? Yes. Yeah, so it's, um, yeah. It, it, uh, the, the results are either positive or negative. Can you make a normative judgment about whether that, you know, being positive or negative is either good or bad, or is it a neutral Oh. kind of a response? Um, well, there's a, a couple, there's, um, so there's a couple pieces of that. So one piece is if you're, if a tumor has EGFR, is that good or bad? You know, on its own, just you know, independent, you know, is that a good or bad pr prognostic sign? I think in esophageal data, cancer, I know of some data that EGFR being negative. I don't know the prognostic data in gastric cancer. There could be data I don't know about them. There may be, I think the the, the thing that I think about the most is for there are a group of tumors that have genomic events activating EGFR, um, it's for example, genomic a amplifications. And so the question has been, can we target those with inhibitors just like we target the HER2 patients? Um, so far, those, well, many of those trials have not been successful, but I think there are, um, but a lot of those trials uh, didn't actually use biomarkers to figure out who to give the drugs to. They gave them drugs to everybody without necessarily looking at who was EGFR positive. And, um, you know, um, so I think, you know, we're not there yet, but I think the question when you have, just like many of these other targets is, you know, yes, the target's there. And so I think we want to evaluate hitting that target as part of therapy. But I think what we're not doing there is asking the question about what else we do besides just hitting that one target. You know, what does the tumor do around that? You know, and I think too often in clinical development, you know, we say, okay, we have a target, we tried the drug, it didn't work. Well, you know, just because one thing didn't work by itself doesn't mean we can't figure out why and find a way to make it better. So I think the challenge for our field now is to say, okay, when things don't work, especially when we have a really good reason, like as a good marker that's in that tumor, and you have a gene that really think is driving that cancer, and you have a drug that can hit it, you know, okay, so maybe that by itself doesn't do it. But when that doesn't work, I think the answer is not to give up, but to <laughs> roll up your sleeves and figure out why it's not working and how to make it better. You know, but that takes a lot of work in the laboratory, but I think that's where the field needs to move. Um, and let me get on my <laughs> soapbox for one moment about that. Um, in that, so many of the, uh, one of the ways we learn this is from uh, increasingly with our trials now, uh, we're trying to in, put in optional <laughs> biopsies. So a patient might have a, uh, get a, have an alteration of gene X in their tumor, and they go on a anti-gene X drug, you know, to see how that works. In some of these trials, you have an optional biopsy a few weeks or a month in to actually get a sample of the tumor to see what's happening. You know, it's optional, but for people on those trials, I know it's easier said than done, but I would consider saying yes to those biopsies because that's one of the ways we learn, you know, why the drugs aren't working and how to make it better the next time. So for people on trials, you know, you know, I would consider saying yes to those optional biopsies because that lets us um, try to do the work and figure out the, the escape routes of cancer, you know, because it's not going to be one drug for one patient. That's just the starting point. May I add something yes. to that? So we also have to think about um, the fact that tumors are very what we call heterogeneous, meaning that the same cells aren't all the way through the tumor, and there are some cells that might have the marker on the cell surface. There are other cells in the same tumor that might not. And I explain it to patients as having 
red, blue, yellow marks, and some cells may have a red mark, some may have a yellow mark. Uh, specifically, your question about the HER2 or HER1, we have to also remember that normal tissue has some of these same markers. So while we call them tumor markers, they can be expressed on normal cells. For example, in the medications we use to target HER1, HER2, uh, one of the normal tissues that has the greatest number of these receptors is the skin. So that skin toxicity from these medications that target those receptors uh, is a big problem. So normal tissue can have some of the same markers as the tumors uh, have. I think Very nice explanation. That's an excellent point, and it's something we actually we need to learn more about because we, we don't know as much how the tumors are heterogeneous. So that's something we're working on, but that's an, another important reason these therapies might fail. We have a, a question up here in the front. Bring, please bring the mic to the front row. In the meantime, I'd like to ask you an online question. How do you get genetic studies started, question mark? Is it done with blood, tumor, or both? Uh, it depends on what you're looking for. So when you are looking at the genes that you inherit from mom and dad, such as whether you have a, uh, you know, at risk of, you have a, if, you know, a patient with uh, diffuse gastric cancer wants to know if they have a congenital CDH1 mutation. That you can get from anything. That could be from blood or a swab of your cheek or, or anything. Uh, when you're actually wanting to look at tumor somatic alterations, the things that are in the cancer that are not in the tumor, traditionally uh, that's still done with a piece of the tumor. Now, uh, the caveat I, I was, I'm saying tr traditionally, because there's a lot of interest now in developing diagnostics and ways to look at the cancer genome that don't require actually a piece of tumor. So there's interest in looking at either what's circulating in the blood, because you know there are what they're called circulating tumor cells, or there's even ideas that as tumor cells in our body die, they release DNA, so you could find tumor DNA circulating in the blood, which is a area of uh, uh, sort of a, a, a a lot of work right now, and one potential benefit of that is that, you know, to the point that uh, Edith made about the tumors being heterogeneous, there's the potential that if what's in your liver metastasis is different than what's in the stomach, that if you looked at the circulating uh, material, you might get both of that, whereas if you just looked at the stomach, you wouldn't find something that's in the liver but not the stomach. So I think, you know, for most standard testing now, like what's done at Dana-Farber and big cancer centers and most companies, they are looking at tumor, but the techniques are getting better, and there's a lot of companies and efforts developing to look at the circulating markers as well. Any other questions? Things. I had heard that the uh, DNA of, of cancer genes, <clears throat> excuse me, is very unstable, and especially mm -hmm. at the point where the uh, cells are multiplying. And I was thinking that that probably could be a weakness that could be explored. But I was also wondering, does that change the uh, the DNA of, of a tumor? And over time, mm -hmm. like you maybe have her her two negative and then become her two positive, yes. uh, because I thought. Uh, I had read that someplace. Can, can you elaborate more on yeah, that? Yeah, I think that's, that's true on multiple levels. So, so definitely it's true that you know, the, you know, all of our cells, whenever a cell divides, it has to make a copy of its DNA. So there's a lot of tools our body has made to sort of proofread and try to avoid uh, errors in that process. And a lot of those same uh, processes get, um, are not working in cancer, so they are unstable, and it's every time a cancer cell divides, you know, that the daughter cells are going to have DNA that's a little bit different. So clearly that is a potential reason we talk about the tumors being heterogeneous, that you know, maybe some of the tumors hurt too, but another part of it picks up another alteration, and so they could have something else uh, either instead of or in addition to her too. You know, I think it's also there's a lot of hope that this uh, abnormal kind of uh, uh, DNA could be a vulnerability, and I think a lot of traditional chemotherapy has been trying to target this uh, this sort of abnormal <laughs> DNA and this the potential sensitivity of how the tumors might kind of respond worse to you know drugs like cisplatin and so forth, which really <laughs> muck up your DNA. I think there are sort of newer classes of more targeted drugs that we might 
be able to also use in this way, and maybe we need to think about how to effectively mix that with targeted therapy, chemotherapy, et cetera, which is also the more reason we need to you know, build the models and evaluate these ideas in the lab so we could bring the most promising ideas forward into patients. But I think these are all feasible things we need to be working on. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, and then I have to search other doctors and try to get second opinions, but again, a lot of times it's just a repeat uh, of it, and I'm really hungry for that information. It really, and, yeah, this is like thinking about the possible clinical trials that are available. Yes, and just yeah. trying to understand it and look at what's yeah. available throughout the world. Yeah. Um, and, um, and luckily, that's a good I, question. I, I don't know if I, how much I want to answer this, or because Edith is giving the next talk about clinical trials. Yeah, so I, I think I think we uh, can maybe let we her should, cover it. Yeah, yeah, maybe we should let. But that is a fantastic question, which maybe is the best segue into yeah. uh, the next speaker. Unless I um, think so. But anyway, um, but also ask me questions. I uh, I told um, <laughs> Debbie the story after I get to this talk either a year or two ago. I got an email from a woman from Tasmania who watched the seminar online who gave me information about her mom's uh, gastric cancer. So, um, so I think you know, there's also other opportunities to ask uh, questions, so even not as far as Tasmania, so yeah.